LifeLog application, how many of you have heard of it? And how many actually use it? Good. So uh, the LifeLog application is a, it's an application that does uh, life logging. What's interesting about it is that it uh, does uh, life log or log many different aspects of your life, not only fitness related uh, things, um, but also uh, where you take pictures, uh, what music you're listening to, how social you are in terms of phone calls, etc. Not which people you're calling to, but how much uh, and at what times and places. Uh, your sleep data, etc. Um, and <coughs> physical activities if you're running, if you're uh, on a bus, etc. Uh, so this is a very broad picture compared to several other life logging applications. Uh, if you want to track uh, things like sleep data, um, which we can see here, uh, we track not only um, sleep in general, but uh, level of sleep, deep sleep and light sleep. Uh, you need a um, uh, smart band. Um, and there are also some social aspects to this. You can share activities and add your own photos, etc. So, um, I don't know if you've seen the smart bands, but there are uh, two smart bands on the market. Uh, one which is called SWR10 and one which is uh, called uh, SWR30, which is, and the name is Smart Band Talk. Um, if you want to get one of these, I would recommend the Smart Band Talk because it has better uh, sleep uh, tracking, automatic tracking. Uh, so that's uh, really nice, and it has a nice feature also as well uh, that you can actually talk, uh, make calls in the, in the phone. Not only set up the calls, but you can actually uh, use the mic and uh, to talk while uh, in a call. Um, so in total, we uh, we store this uh, data that you log yourself and. Um, uh, all these different kinds of data, location, walking, sleep, weight. Weight, we actually don't track, you have to enter that manually yourself. Um, physical activities, communication activities, which we mentioned. And currently we're at about 12 terabyte raw data. Actually, it's not currently, this was some months ago, so it's uh, more. And uh, structured and compressed, it's about a terabyte or one and a half terabyte. And what we hope to do with this data is to uh, deliver um, value to our users in terms of insights so that they can compare themselves with how they change over time and also compare themselves to others, to the population. How do they sleep compared to others? How do they, uh, how much calories do they consume compared to others? Uh, at Mobile World Congress in Barcelona, uh, not so long ago, we presented a uh, new version of LifeLog that hasn't been released yet, uh, but what we demoed there was uh, this. Different uh, insights in cards that we are uh, showing in the LifeLog applications. So we show achievements when you have done something uh, specific, for example, walked uh, or climbed as high as uh, Mount Everest in total, or achieved certain milestones, maybe a marathon. Uh, Sleep summaries, step summaries compared to, uh, I mean, how, how much uh, you have uh, slept during the week, how you slept during the week compared to last week. Um, your sleep versus others. So here you see the population and uh, where other people, uh, where most people, how much they sleep in general. Uh, and we will also provide some uh, insights about locations, how much time you spend at home and at, at work and other places. Um, so you as a, as, a, as a user, you access this data through the LifeLog application. Um, but as an application developer, you can also access this data on behalf of a single user. So if you have an application where you want uh, to integrate uh, LifeLog data or maybe make some, have some insight about the users that you can use in your application, you can access the LifeLog API and you can access most of this data uh, 
and integrate it. But as I said, you do this on behalf of a single user. You can only access it from each user. So you have to find the, the users yourself. <coughs> uh, the Lifelog API, it's a REST-based API. It has um, one, two, three, four, five, six different endpoints. Um, activities, application, start end, physical activities, transportation, music, camera, sleep, um, location, weather, uh, goals, bookmarks, profile. So bookmarks is something that the user can set on a, on a certain occasion with, uh, I think it's only with the uh, uh, SWR10 smart band. You actually press a button and it sets a bookmark, which means that it's really a bookmark in, in, in time. And then uh, you can view information collected at that specific time and browse backwards to that. So this is the data you can access. Mm, we have, um, you access this, you, to access it, you have to sign up at the developer uh, site. There's an API explorer. Um, let's have a look at it. So we should probably refresh. Okay. So you have to authenticate. I already did that before uh, with a Google ID or a Sony Mobile ID. So you have to be, yes. Yes, so you can't access all of those. Uh, so you can select a certain method, for example, users me. And unauthorized, okay, that's not good. Let's refresh. Not going so well. Still not authenticated. Not authorized. Okay. Try Chrome instead. <sighs> what is this? This worked just fine before. It seems this doesn't, uh, my browser seems to have some, yeah, token expired. Okay, um, unfortunately I can't show it to you then. Uh, but these are the three endpoints um, uh, that you can access. Let's have a look at them 
at them like this instead. So from location, you can get uh, uh, the data looks like uh, this. So um, you get the sources where how the data was collected, start and end time, positions, an ID of the event, uh, and you get a long list of these uh, uh, from between start time and end time. Uh, for uh, activities, this is an example response. It's a physical activity, it's walking, um, it also has start and end times, etc. And also the number of steps for each minute during this time, the distance you walked uh, for each minute. Uh, this is uh, how much calories you consumed. Uh, for each minute, include and the difference between these two is that they include and doesn't include uh, background uh, calorie consumption of just being alive. Uh, and then we have um, application activities, uh, camera activities, if it's photo or video. Music activity, here we get start time and end time uh, for the whole uh, listening period. And uh, album, artist, uh, title, start end time. And uh, you actually also get information about the player, I think. If it's Spotify or something else. Uh, physical activity types we already looked at. And sleep activity. So uh, here we get the start and end time and uh, if it's awake, light or deep sleep. So because <coughs> uh, with this smart band you can have a period during a long, if you sleep uh, during a night you can have short periods where you are uh, almost awake or awake, actually awake, but it will still be considered to be within that sleep period. Okay, so uh, uh, fortunately enough, I downloaded some data uh, through the API uh, before uh, coming here, uh, so we will um, uh, use that. And um, we will use IPython, uh, Python scikit-learn, um, uh, both supervised and unsupervised uh, machine learning algorithms to um, analyze uh, location data. And scikit-learn is a, it's a very complete or quite complete uh, machine learning toolkit for Python. Uh, they have also a very good uh, documentation and introduction to machine learning in general and a very nice set of APIs that is quite consistent of the different um, methods. So I, I really recommend it, even if you want to use it in production, I recommend to use it for, for learning about machine learning. Uh, they provide this uh, nice uh, sheet sheet for um, choosing an algorithm depending on your problem. Uh, this sheet sheet actually doesn't cover all the methods. We will be using um, uh, density-based algorithm that is not uh, included here uh, for clustering locations and then uh, we'll use a classification method, uh, this one, uh, for uh, predicting uh, future locations. Uh, but depending on your problem you can find your way here. So, let's uh, hope that this works then. So, um, how many of you use Python? IPython? IPython notebook? <laughs> okay, good. So, um, notebooks uh, are a really good way to uh, document your experiments as a data scientist. 
because what it does is that it combines uh, your code together with your documentation and the results. Uh, this uh, means that you can keep all your experiments and you can also share them with others in a consistent way. So this has been become a very popular way of also writing books and uh, tutorials um, since it's easy to, to publish and uh, to share. Uh, so what it means is that we execute uh, IPython, which is a Python shell, inside a, a browser and uh, we see the results in the browser and we can step through the different steps. So um, let's just uh, open location data. Can you see this? Is it too small? It's okay? Can Sorry? Can you uh, let's One more step. Okay. So, um, I have the location data in a file called locations. Uh, I will just uh, load that and we will have a look at the first um, entry. So we can see we uh, got some data here. It has a start time, an end time, a position with uh, latitude and a longitude. And we can see that we got this from the LifeLog application and a phone. Um, we can extract the um, latitude uh, like uh, this. And um, if we just extract all the latitudes and longitudes and zip them together and then uh, plot them uh, just to, to get an image of what is this kind of data, we can see that uh, uh, there's little, very little variation in this data. Uh, there's 7,000 uh, location events, but uh, there's apparently uh, something happening here where uh, the user travels somewhere far, probably. And uh, uh, short variations around that as well. Um, so, when you get a new data set, what you want to do is tr just try to get an image of, of what is this, what, what does it contain. Um, and uh, line plots may be not so uh, useful in this case since it's uh, geometrical data, so we want to, to see how it, uh, to plot it on, on a scatter plot instead. And we can see that, as we suspect, most of the data is, is in one big cluster and then uh, these two spikes here are in probably in a, in a very different place. Uh, so I don't know if you used uh, the base map um, uh, package in, in Python, but it's a very nice package for uh, putting your data on, on uh, maps. Uh, here it's very rough, etc., but you can uh, do this. Uh, uh, much more detailed and they have access to all kinds of uh, uh, geographical data as well and uh, different kinds of transform map transformations etc. Uh, so what I just did here was plot the data um, uh, and uh, uh, put it uh, on, on the map and as we can see this is clearly uh, Denmark, Skåne, uh, this user, which is actually not me, but a colleague of mine, has been traveling here uh, up to, I don't know where is that is on the west coast, and mostly around uh, Skåne here. Um, so, uh, We want to plot, as you saw, this is only, what I did here was just to add a few degrees to, to, uh, to, the, uh, uh, to this one here, to, to put it on a map, but this one wasn't actually captured in, in this map, so um, let's try to figure out where that is as well. So where is this? Paris, yes. 
So, uh, what um, we want to do next um, is to try to find out uh, what are the most important points in locations in this user's uh, life. Wh wh where, where is he and what does these points, personal points of interest mean to him? And uh, when does he, he deviate from, from this? So we will use uh, dbscan, which is a density-based clustering algorithm, uh, which means that um, it doesn't look only at the distance to, to nearby points, but also how many points are nearby. Uh, so points that are near many other points are considered to be in, in a cluster. Um, we, that's as easy as saying uh, uh, use the clustering um, uh, objects in, in uh, scikit-learn and uh, use the dbscan algorithm. Epsilon is a parameter that decides uh, uh, how many points will be in, in a cluster or actually uh, that's the uh, distance and uh, I will get to the number of points later. Uh, then we want to fit this model uh, uh, and we also uh, uh, make a prediction immediately and then we can look at uh, what, I, what it does here. Uh, when it does a fit and predict, it means that it takes all the points, all the location data we that we supplied, uh, and uh, uh, tries to find the different clusters. And uh, what we are trying to do now is to find out what what is this F then. Um, so we can see it found 74 different clusters. Uh, so this is the set of clusters that it has found, uh, just a, a list of them. Uh, so if we try to understand this a bit more by plotting them on, on as a histogram, how many of these points, how many of these clusters do the user actually uh, stay any or visit more often than others? We can see that there are some that are extremely more often oftenly visited than others. So 73 clusters, that's probably far too much. Um, one thing about uh, density-based clustering is that we don't have to assign, we don't have to decide beforehand how many clusters we are looking for. If you use a simple uh, clustering algorithm like k-means, for example, you have to know how many clusters you are looking for, but we don't know that since we don't know how, how many locations the user actually uh, dwell a lot in. So, uh, and other points that are not at these clusters will be not be assigned to any cluster, so they will be considered noise. Uh, in k-means you don't have that. All points uh, belong to one cluster, even if they are very far away from, from the other clusters. So, this seems to be a bit much Let's uh, require that each point of interest we're looking at, each cluster has at least 100 visits. Now we get only six cluster and the minus one is noise, all those points that are not assigned to any other, any cluster. <coughs> so if we plot uh, the number of visits um, as a histogram, we can see that there's a lot of noise, lots of points that are not assigned to cluster. Um, that's not so strange uh, if you use your drives car, for example, to, daily to work, there will be lots of points that are not assigned to a cluster because they are too far away from each other. But we can say that there are two clusters here that are much more important than others. Uh, my guess is that these are home and, uh, home and work. So let's try to put these uh, on a, in a scatter plot. Uh, you can see small colored dots here. So this is the whole of Skåne, if I remember correctly. Still a bit hard to see, so 
let's try to narrow that down. Okay, so this area here is actually this area here. Um, and we don't see this one, it's below here. So one, two, three, four, five, six clusters. Um, and um, I looked up at the map where this was, and uh, this is actually in. Uh, Lundersköping, yeah. And this is uh, Center Syd, uh, local pizzeria, uh, and a jogging recreational area. And this is uh, uh, in Lund, so this is actually work. Uh, So, if we uh, take um, uh, from, from uh, the cluster object, uh, we have the label. So the label is actually a list of classified uh, locations. Uh, so we can um, print this. And it looks like this. Yeah. So, Noise, 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 staying at location zero, then at one, zero, uh, noise, noise, yeah. So this is uh, the progression of, of location uh, events and the, the different classes they belong to. So you can see there's a lot of noise here where the user is moving around and it's not actually belonging to any uh, specific uh, cluster. So if we try to, if we remove those uh, noise points um, and also any repeating points, uh, because we're not really interested in, in how long the user stays now. I mean, that's, if you want to do location prediction, that's a very important factor, the staying, uh, how, how long the user stays at the place, or if you want to understand the semantics, what does this place actually mean to user? It's an important factor, but uh, let's, in this case, just try to predict what the next place in is. Um, I put it in a variable called sequence, so that looks like this. So this is a sequence of, of points of interest uh, or clusters that the user actually visits. Um, there's one here that's very rarely visited, one that's visited really a lot, and the others, well, almost equally much. Um, now, uh, if we look at the probability, how, how many times um, the user moves from one to another. So here on the first here, you can see zero, one, two, three, four, five, six. This is the uh, where the user is currently, and that is where his he moves next. So you can see here that uh, from zero to one, uh, one seems uh, fifty-three. So one seems to be the most in independently of where the user starts. He usually goes to one except for m number six, where it actually moves to number three more often. Uh, so let's try to predict the next POI, given the current one. Uh, so we create a training set. Uh, this is just formatting it in the way that uh, scikit-learn wants it. And then uh, let's try to apply a, different, a couple of different uh, Algorithm. So let's start with uh, support vector machines. Support vector machines is a, a linear binary classification algorithm that you can extend to non-binary cases and also to non-linear cases by doing a kernel trick. So you transform the input space. Um, it's really uh, 
used a lot, especially in natural language processing. It's very efficient. There are very good implementations of it. Uh, so the implementation used by in uh, scikit-learn is from a uh, from a C implementation that's extremely efficient and, and uh, used a lot. Um, so what we're doing here is just importing this model uh, support vector machine. Uh, we fit it uh, using the current POI data. This is the training data. And this is what we're trying to uh, uh, predict. And then we can score how well did we do. And currently we are scoring on the same set that we actually trained this on. So this is quite uh, bad. You would maybe expect it to be uh, a lot better, but there may be reasons uh, that it isn't better. But on the other hand, we're only using the current POI, and we saw that uh, from the current POI, it's the most common case just to go to single, to number one, was it? Uh, so this may actually be a, a quite different problem. Uh, we can use K near K nearest neighbor classifier as well. Uh, we can try random forest classifier. So this is the kind of beauty with the scikit-learn that you can easily just uh, try a different uh, different algorithms. But it's actually quite important, of course, to have an understanding of these models. But uh, in this kind of exploratory phase, you can just try out some different things. Uh, we can try decision trees. Uh, so uh, it doesn't go very well, I think. Uh, well, it's on the we we are only looking at the training set, so it's maybe it should be better than that. Um, but we have only used the current POI to predict the next. So let's try to use the previous two at least. Um, Okay, there is the prediction rather than the scoring. So, and let's just look at random forest classifier and also support vector machine. So, using two previous actually gives us uh, above 50%. But still, we're only using the training set. We're lo just looking at what we are already know. We're not trying to predict something we haven't seen before. So let's try to predict uh, on something we haven't seen before. So to do that, we have to split our training set into two sets. And, uh, uh, and we train it on one set, and then we uh, test it on a different set that it hasn't seen before. So we get almost 50% when trying to s uh, classify on an unseen uh, set. Uh, that's almost the same as uh, on the training set. So it seems that even though the performance was, the accuracy was maybe low, uh, it's actually generalizes quite well. Yep. Uh, and uh, the support vector machine gets almost equal. But how good is this really? Fifty uh, percent? Is it really any good? So uh, if we try to develop some kind of base. Uh, 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 baseline model just by guessing uh, the most frequent uh, location, uh, what, uh, what would we get then? Uh, uh, we have 202 locations in the test set uh, and we have 58 that are visited most often. So 28% if we guess just the most oftenly visited place. So it's actually a lot better than that. So I think uh, just using the previous two uh, locations to predict the current one, uh, I think this is actually quite good performance or accuracy. And there's a lot more we can do to develop this model. For example, using time of day or uh, uh, staying time and uh, other features to include uh, in, in this model to make it better. So this is just a, a start, a first start, uh, exploratory start, I would say. Any questions on uh, this one? If 
before we move on. Okay, so uh, now we have looked at uh, what you as an application developer can you do with uh, single user uh, data from single user. Now we'll talk a little bit about how we uh, can use uh, data from multiple users uh, and uh, large data sets. Uh, so uh, there's a, this term big data and what it really means is not very clear. Maybe it's that we're looking at data sets bigger than one terabyte, I don't know. It doesn't really matter. What matters is that we use the tools that uh, we need to. And to uh, address really large data sets, we need different tools than um, uh, scikit-learn. Scikit-learn is really great for exploratory uh, modeling and deep modeling, uh, but it doesn't scale very well. Uh, so just to give you some background, actually I think I will skip this in order to uh, fit uh, this into time, <laughs> uh, time slot. So, uh, well, just short. Google produced a uh, map produced or published a map produced paper in 2002. Since then, uh, the open source world has trying to catch up with implementing Hadoop. Uh, actually, just an open source clone of what they published here. Uh, and that was uh, really interesting, but then there are some limitations to Hadoop. And then Spark paper called uh, uh, AmpLab came along, and since then Apache Spark has become a top-level uh, project. And um, the reason for this is that the MapReduce model is really good for uh, batch processing of large data, but every time you complete a MapReduce phase, you have to write to disk, and then you have to write another job to uh, to use that result and often you have to chain a number of jobs together. Uh, so it actually quite takes quite a, lot, a long time often. Uh, so it doesn't really support you to interactively work with large data sets. So there came along a number of projects that tried to address uh, different things that Hadoop didn't support really. So Storm for example for stream processing, Impala for uh, real-time querying, Graph Lab and Giraffe for uh, graph processing. But then Spark came along, and what's interesting is that it is a single computational framework for both batch, stream, uh, interactive, and query processing. It has support for machine learning, uh, machine learning and uh, graph uh, processing through integrated libraries and really good, efficient implementations. It isn't very complete, but it covers uh, most of what you need. Uh, it supports multiple languages, Java, Python, Scala, R, uh, and SQL. And one really important thing is that you can do modeling and uh, production in the same environment. The step from exploratory phase uh, prototyping to production phase is really small compared to doing modeling in R or Python scikit and then trying to productify that through a Java implementation. Really important uh, step. And of course, then uh, the performance of Spark is uh, uh, quite spectacular. Um, they did a 100 terabyte sort on uh, three times faster on 10 th times less machines than uh, uh, Hadoop has uh, achieved. Uh, it does this through using much more in memory processing rather than writing a lot to disk uh, and caching, and then doing uh, optimizations on, on the, what you're going to compute. So Spark is the new black in some sense, and we see a, a lot of uh, trials of Spark now, but also uh, starting to see some deployments. And it's really most projects are moving from Hadoop to, to Spark. Um, the machine learning library, it has some basic stuff, uh, statistics and feature uh, transformations, but it also has the basic uh, machine learning algorithms um, support vector machines, logistic regression, uh, clustering it's not so good at, so it only has k-means clustering, so we want to uh, have a density-based clustering for location data, so that's something we need to, to work on. You can do recommendations, systems, etc. So this is yeah, 
it covers the, the basics with really good implementations. They are quite careful about not just pushing in lots of uh, different algorithms like uh, Mahout uh, did, uh, if you're familiar with that. So uh, they are focusing a lot more on, on performance here. So this is a kind of architecture that we are, are uh, using. Uh, it's a very high level architecture, but we have a, a batch layer uh, where uh, we use uh, all our data uh, in, in batch processing. Then we have a stream layer uh, where we process, uh, we can do stream processing of real time data where the latency from the batch layer is too long. Um, uh, of course, we use the different libraries available in, in Spark uh, uh, to, do, to create application jobs. And we also use uh, uh, interactive uh, uh, coding and analysis, uh, w which you can do in, in, in Spark. You can not only submit <coughs> jobs, but you can also work with it interactively in a shell, just like Python. And um, uh, from these application jobs, we currently uh, use a card server which uh, creates these insights card which I showed you before and push them to, to the LifeLog application. But we also use it internally for uh, our internal uh, business intelligence and quality purposes and internal applications. So just some things that, uh, very basic stuff that we can do this is to uh, look at where are our big biggest markets. Of course, we can do this through Google Analytics as well, but for some countries like Japan, for example, we, we don't get that data through Google Analytics. Uh, so here we can see our bigger biggest markets on, on a map in terms of LifeLog users. We can see uh, what applications LifeLog users use and ho how much. Uh, so lastly, I would like to, maybe we should skip this one and instead go to this one. If you're up for it, some uh, uh, programming in Scala to uh, do something like extracting the most popular uh, song to start your running uh, when, when people run. So I will uh, do it uh, interactively as well, but first, just so you have a pre-understanding of what's going on. In, in uh, Scala and in Spark, uh, you write code, even if you do it interactively, nothing actually gets computed until you take an action. An action is like collect data or uh, take the a number of, uh, take, uh, extract the number of um, items from a data set or save it to a file. It's only then that computation actually starts. So until then, everything is lazily evaluated. It's just a definition of what's going to be computed. So what looks like loading the data from this uh, S3 bucket here doesn't actually do anything. It's just uh, a specification of what's going to happen. Um, so what we will do is we will uh, extract uh, running events from this uh, data we load and we'll filter them uh, so get type is something we have defined here, it's our own schema. But uh, what you do usually in, in Scala and in Spark is that you have a data set and you do transformations. You filter, you map, you, you do reduce, reduce by key, etc. And you work a lot with pair, uh, uh, key value pairs. So what we do first here, we extract only the running items, not walking or, or other transportations. And then we don't want all the data in these uh, running uh, uh, events. We're only interested in, in user IDs, who's running, and when does it start, and when does it end. Um, same thing for music. From the, all the music we have, we just extract the uh, user ID, start time, end time, and the songs. And then, to get the top five running songs, we do join on this, and join, as you remember, we had user IDs for both of them. Uh, so we just put them together, and uh, then we do a filter. If these, what, what join means here, that all the running events will be combined with 
all the uh, listening events, but most many of them will not have any overlap in, in time at all because they were he was not running while listening to music at the same time. So we only have we had to extract those that only have an overlap. Then something really strange happens here. <laughs> so in Scala, you don't. Uh, it's optimized for uh, writing as uh, small code as possible, so it's, sometimes it, it becomes really unreadable. Uh, uh, but it, what we, we don't have a schema for the thing we have created here in this step, so we, extract, we have to extract it in this way by ex accessing uh, uh, the specific uh, tuple. What we're doing here is extracting the song. So this thing here actually contains the title and the artist. And then we combine that with the number one. So why do we combine it with the number one? Because what we'll do then is sum all these uh, together. So the number of times a user has listened to a specific song, Hotel California, will be listed as Hotel California, one, Hotel California, one. And then we sum them, and this is how we do that. Reduce by key, and the key here is the song uh, title and artist. And then we extract the top five of these uh, by then count. So we sum these, count them, and extract them. Um, so let's see if this actually works in, in real life. Uh, so I will do some copy-paste coding here. So. I have a small uh, cluster running here. This is only on uh, Sony Mobile employee data. I mean, LifeLog users that are internal to us or who are actually in the development um, department. Um, so I will. I've logged into the cluster. It's a small cluster. It's three machines. I'm uh, starting a Spark shell and. Then I will do some import, uh, our different schemas, etc. Now, uh, let's uh, load uh, the data, the motions, uh, that's the physical activities and the musics. Uh, so uh, this reference here, I mean, this point, this can be hundreds of terabytes of data. It's still just, you don't need to do anything else to load this data. Or actually, you don't load it. You just uh, say you want to load it sometimes in the future. Oh, what happened? Is that re readable? No. Better? So, but still, you only need to, you don't have to care about how it's distributed or anything. It completely abstracts away from the distribution. Which, uh, if you have done anything like HPC computing or before, it's, this is completely magic. <laughs> uh, so now we have the data. We can actually check uh, yeah. let's uh, define a couple of functions just to extract the song and this is the has overlap function which looks really peculiar maybe but next now uh, we have runs. Uh, so these are the running events. We can do runs for each print line. <coughs> so this is what the data looks like. We have the user ID, start, end time. Uh, next. We look at listens. Uh, 
So here we have user ID, start end time, song. Uh, and now we join them. This is a small data set. It's only, I mean, it's not that many users, so it will be a quite small data set. I hope there are some uh, intersections between running and, and uh, uh, listening to music. So now we put, so we have joined them. So it's a user ID, start and end time for the running, start and end time for the listen, and then the song. Maybe this is completely uh, <laughs> unreadable, but. Uh, I hope you can follow. So now let's filter out those that only have o overlap. So not that many songs. No, what I did here in this has overlap function was just to look at if they have any overlap at all okay. over the time period. Uh, and now we sum them. Uh, so the, the key here, um, uh, what we did was that uh, we filtered with overlap and then uh, we extracted uh, the key, which is the song title, and uh, the number one, and then we uh, sum them for each key, and the key is the song title and name here. So now we see, okay, so someone listened to Procession by Queen two times while running, etc. So this is the list, and then lastly, uh, we are extracting the top five. So, Dennis Koyo, Mike Snow, Pretender, yeah. I don't know what that is, but uh, apparently that was the top song by uh, yeah. Dennis Koyo remix, Mike Snow. Let's try to find that one. Okay. So I think that concludes uh, my talk today. So my recommendation is to use R for, or Scikit for modeling and prototyping on, on smaller data sets and then use uh, Spark for large scale analytics. But can, you can actually do the, much of the modeling in Spark itself. So you don't have to move from uh, prototyping to production. Uh, it's really fun to use uh, Spark. I mean, in general, machine learning, etc., is really fun and data analysis. But uh, coding in, in Scala and Spark is actually really fun and th this uh, functional approach. And if you're interested uh, in knowing more, uh, talk to me or talk to Ida. We are uh, uh, interested in talent in this area, even if we know what's going on at uh, Sony at the moment. But uh, talk to us.